Namaskara, good morning and welcome to today's BIC stream session towards an equal hue, women's cricket and the future of the sports movement in India. Today's discussion with panelists, sports journalist Sharda Ugra, uh, Dr. Rafael Nicholson, senior lecturer in sport and sustainability, Bournemouth University, moderated by sports lawyer Nandan Kamath focuses on the issues and challenges surrounding women's cricket in India, the reforms required to develop the women's game, and the relevance of these to the sports movement in the country. The speakers will discuss the history of the government structures of the women's game, how women's cricket has grown in the UK in comparison to India, the commercial issues surrounding the sport, and the way forward in our country. The session is being conducted in collaboration with the Sports Law and Policy Center, SLPC, under the AGs of their annual flagship symposium. I'd like to invite Yogita uh, to take uh, the panel forward. Thank you so much, Leka. The Sports Law and Policy Center, in collaboration with the Bangalore International Center, is pleased to introduce our panelists for the session. We have Sharda Ugra, senior sports journalist who started her career with The Midday before working with Radio Australia, The Hindu, India Today magazine, and the ESPN. She's seen India play cricket in over nine countries, presented conference papers on Indian sport, covered two Olympic Games, and won the Sports Journalist Federation of India Award for Sports Writing. We have Raphael Nicholson, senior lecturer at the Business School of Bournemouth University, her research sits at the boundary between contemporary history and sociology and focuses on gender and sport. Her PhD examined the history of women's cricket in Britain since 1945, providing the first comprehensive overview of the development of the sport in modern period. Her research is, is concerned with the changing role of women in sports governance since the 1990s. She's also a freelance journalist who writes for ESPN Crick Info, buys Cricket Monthly, and edits the Women's Cricket website, thecricketer.com. We're now pleased to also in introduce the moderator for this session, Mr. Nandan Kamath, Principal Lawyer at Law NK, based in Bangalore, India. His practice specializes in sports, technology, and media laws, with clients ranging from international and national sports federations to leagues, teams, sponsors, and athletes. He's also the managing trustee of the Go Sports Foundation. If you have any questions during this session or any other sessions at the symposium, please type them in the question and answer box below, and our panelists will try to answer them at the end of the session. I'll now hand it over to Sharda. So, all over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Yogita. Um, like they say every day in these conferences, I hope I'm audible. Good morning. Hello. Welcome to everyone uh, who's here on this feed, on this link. Uh, thank you again to the Sports Law and Policy Center. Uh, for an invitation to deliver this keynote alongside uh, Raf Nicholson, who's been a champion of uh, women's cricket for many years and, and a colleague of sorts uh, in my time at ESPN Cricket. So, so Raf, a big salam to you and, and uh, 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 many brownie points for waking up so early in the morning to speak to all of us. Uh, great to be here on this uh, uh, BIC uh, uh, Sunday morning program and, and, and to be talking uh, with all of you. Um, before I begin, I just want to set down some essential fundamentals of this keynote that I'm about to give or this little talk that I'm about to give. I have a friend uh, back in Australia called Mike Coward, who is a um, cricket writer, speaker, an original Australian uh, uh, cricketing indo field. And he has this wonderful habit of making everything into a cricketing metaphor. Everything that happens to you in life, Mike will turn it into a cricketing metaphor. So if you're sitting alongside him in the press box and you're getting a earful from the office, Mike will look at you and go and say, oh, the wicket's a bit damp, is it? Uh, or if anyone was going crazy because, you know, we're waiting for a superstar to turn up and we'll just start ranting and raving, he'll say, I think you're, uh, this is a little bit of slog over batting from you now, isn't it? So he has this very habit. So that's what I'm going to do. So in a sort of hat tip uh, to, to, to Mike, I'm uh, uh, going to tell you the um, sort of essential uh, uh, core in which this, this, this talk is going to be held. Um, it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be about, uh, I'm just trying to find my notes right here. They're here. They're here. Okay. So I will be coming off a long run and naturally I will be bowling short. Uh, let me begin by putting, uh, a two, two sort of, uh, uh, statements to you and, and, and just think of the two thoughts out here. Think of them as the, as the bouncer and the beamer. So here's the beamer, which is direct 
and it has no good intentions. What I'm saying is that if we compare Indian women's cricket or other the Indian women's cricket team with our elite women athletes in most other sports, we find uh, that the current generation of women cricketers are treated with less respect for their craft than India's other female athletes. Uh, across what are our priority sports, shooting, hockey, hockey, wrestling, badminton, boxing, and so on. Now, here's the bouncer. The bouncer asks the question of the batter, and it poses a problem. Uh, so it requires a response which indicates either your professional competence or, you know, panic stricken escape. So my bouncer with regard to the question of women's cricket is this. The BCCI standard operating procedures currently in place around women's cricket appear to indicate one of three facts. The first, um, that they are overjoyed, but they don't appear to know what to do about the fact uh, that India now has a women's team that gets public attention and it's grabbed notice. The second, um, that they are not exactly comfortable or overjoyed uh, with the fact that, uh, that, that so I, I, I got the order wrong. Let me start again. Firstly, uh, they are not exactly comfortable or overjoyed that the, the women's team has done what it's done. The reason that they're not comfortable or overjoyed is because they don't know what to do. And the third thing is that they are not overjoyed because they don't know what to do and they would rather that the women uh, aren't around. Now, all these conclusions, I think, are what you call in this day and age. Uh, maybe all the lawyers could tell me if they are libelous and if I should be using the word allegedly in here. Um, but I'm, I, I, I used to sort of uh, obey Sunil Gavaskar's uh, uh, sort of advice from his playing days when he said that journalists should not try and read players' minds, players or officials' minds. So I'm not reading minds here. All I have are the facts at hand. Uh, so let me start by putting uh, Indian women's cricket in the context of our uh, doing like a cross-discipline um, comparison of where we stand. Our most recent impressions of Indian women's cricket come from Shefali Verma's absolutely fireworks-inspired uh, 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 test and red ball debut, which was the same day, uh, the dramatic draw that the team pulled off in Bristol, and uh, it's so far underwhelming performance in the one-day series that's currently on. Going back a little bit to May, we had the announcement of retainer contracts for 19 uh, women's players. Now, in monetary terms, the, uh, you'd think that the country's uh, top women cricketers were being given much respect. They were awarded three-tier contracts of rupees 50 lakh, rupees 30 lakh, and rupees 20 lakh, which in Indian terms is a very, very good living wage. These generous contract terms are targeted, we must remember, only towards the top 19 players in the country. The figures mentioned is far greater than what the bulk of India's women athletes will earn. Uh, 50 lakh, 30 lakh, 20 lakh. Uh, this will be outside a very select few, three or four in our history, whose international performances were rewarded very handsomely with uh, um, uh, from three sources. Their prize money, their endorsements, and government rewards. So we're not getting into the prize money debate right here, but we're asking another question, whether respect for an athlete, whether it's only about money particularly for women athletes, is it only about money? Must it not involve access, opportunity, playing time? So in this regard, where have our top flight women cricketers uh, been treated? So let's look at the period between January the 1st, 2019 and say around December the 31st, 2020. We're looking at a period of 24 months. I'm not including ICC tournaments in this because these don't, those don't require sort of the energies of the home world. Um, of the Indian board. And in this time, the Indian women's team, in these 24 months, they played 32 matches, 12 ODIs and 20 T20 internationals. Their last competitive fixture before COVID was, of course, the World T20 final against Australia, which pulled in 86,174 people on March the 8th, 2020. After this, their 2020 tour of uh, England in July, August was cancelled because of reasons that seem unconvincing at this point, or even then. From the next 12 months, they had no cricket outside of the four IPL T20 matches um, that were almost pushed in like a token gesture alongside the fact that the IPL was being held in uh, the UAE. So the Plus, the women's team went without a selection panel from January to September 2020. Uh, they, ha they had, till the last time I checked, no single point person whose job was to focus and oversee women's cricket. So this is where the women's uh, cricketers stand. Now let's look at uh, the best known uh, uh, team outside of cricket, best known sports team outside of cricket uh, uh, with reference to women, which is the hockey, women's hockey team. None of them are contracted. They all hold public sector jobs. 
When the pandemic struck in February and March 2020, they were returning from a tour of New Zealand. From January 1st, 2019, that same period, uh, they had, till this uh, the tour of New Zealand in 2020, they had played matches in Spain, in Malaysia, in Korea, in Japan, twice in Japan and in, and in England. They played these short series. Before the tour of New Zealand, um, in 2020, they beat USA in an Olympic qualifier held in Oasis. This year, in the run-up to the Tokyo Olympics, uh, they have toured Germany and Argentina. At the moment, they are in what they are calling a Tokyo time sort of bubble. They are they are living, get waking up, sleeping, depending on Tokyo time, getting ready to adjust to that. Now, in absolute terms, the difference between men's and women's hockey is considerable, but they do have a year-round playing calendar. So moving on to another sport in which the women have done well internationally, it's boxing. From the information that is available, the same period, January 1st, 2019 to date, uh, says that our elite, a group of our elite women boxers have participated in tournaments in Jordan, Hungary, Bulgaria, Spain, Turkey, Dubai, again in Bulgaria and in Serbia. Some of these tournaments were alongside men, some were exclusive women's competition. Now, we must point out that the examples being cited here are not reflections of a progressive administration in a few Indian sports. We see these very focused pathways at the very least around the top tier of the women's game because they are mandated for International Sports Federation who want to be part of the International Olympic movement. The Olympic Charter talks the talk and walks the talk and talks it about the need to encourage, and I'm quoting from the charter here, the need to encourage and support the promotion of women in sport at all levels and in all structures with a view to implementing the principal equality of men and women. Close quotes. Whether the sports administrators at the very top in sports like boxing, hockey, whatever else other uh, the priority sports are, whether they believe in the principal equality of men and women or not, these regular match and tournament calendars for the women's participants are essential for their financial survival. An article from our Play the Game website found uh, that of the 28 international sports federations that are present at the Olympic Games, 15 of those 28 uh, federations depend on the Olympics um, bet for between 35 to 96 percent of their income. So they have no. So driving women's sport today uh, is one of the core best, best practices that is taking port, uh, uh, place in international sports governance. Tokyo, we are being told, is going to be the most gender-balanced Olympic Games in history. In the 100th year of the Olympics, in Atlanta, 1996, uh, women formed 34% of the athletes. The figure in Tokyo is expected to be a record 48.8% female athletes to the 51.2% male athletes. In March last year, last year, the IOC declared that for the first time in 125 years, every country at an Olympic Games would have at least one female and one male participant in Tokyo. Again, for the first time, two athletes are allowed to carry their national flag at the opening ceremony, one man and one woman. Now, post-COVID, we'll have a greater idea of the percentage parity numbers and whether uh, that new opening ceremony rule is played out and countries where they actually turn up and, and, and they have this uh, one man, one woman uh, uh, carrying the flag. But the fact is that in the biggest event in global sport, it has gone down a road from when there is happily no turning back. Now, let me also point uh, you towards the urgency with which Olympic sports are responding to women's participation. The increase of women's participation at the Olympic has come about with a deliberate pruning and retooling around men's sports, particularly in the most male of those sports, combat sports. I'll just briefly touch upon uh, the three in which Indian women compete, judo, boxing, and wrestling. Judo was introduced in the, into the Olympic Games in 1992 as a medal sport. And since then, men and women have competed in seven weight categories. So that's equal participation, opportunities, and equal medals on offer. In freestyle wrestling, uh, in one phase, men competed across 20 weight categories. And women did not compete till about 2004. So those 20 weight categories have now been cut down to 12. Women wrestlers now compete in six categories. Wrestling was actually threatened with Olympic extinction in 2017, and they cut 56 spots in men's freestyle wrestling in order to come up to come close to a gender balance. Boxing has similarly dropped from four way, uh, has dropped four weight categories from among its men, uh, who now compete in eight as opposed to 12, and whereas women compete in five. By the Paris Olympics of 2024, the IOC, that's the International Olympic Committee, 
wants athletic cycling and boxing to be perfectly gender balanced uh, what we have also see at this point is the issue of the transgender athlete but that's a topic for another day now how does this deliberate purposeful gender balance at the top level translate itself across the indian sports movement um you can actually say that the stakeholders of our sport in olympic sport particularly have not been given any options but to comply as long as the olympics have a great hold over the indian sporting imagination our sporting governance particularly when it comes to questions of female access and participation will fortunately be dictated uh, by a more progressive world view the need to stay in step with international practices produces a knock on effect it translate into policy changes which leads to which leads to a better spread of participation a more equitable distribution of training and playing calendars and from there you're back on to the cycle of results and funding for all the flaws that exist in the olympic movement whether it's gigantism or their eye watering corruption we cannot fault it for the absolute commitment to ensuring that those who hold up half the sky have an equal right to own half the space under the olympic tent in the midst of these transformative changes taking place across the go, go, uh, global sporting landscape and finding themselves replicated to an extent in the indian sports movement we are left looking at the state of indian women's cricket and the word i'm going to use for it is a very harsh one it is shabby it does not the, now that word does not do justice to the pockets of excellence that have been created over the course of say over 10 15 years across the country with reference to women's cricket uh, but i'm using the word shabby in a big picture sense standing back and being deeply saddened by how the world's richest and strongest cricket country treats its women's players not just the national team in which they have given them these uh, 19 uh, women they've given them these uh, generous contracts or what you can say thrown money at them but at one level below it's a team the people that are just pushing towards the boundaries of getting now a few days ago a colleague of mine jonathan selvaraj from espn he reminded me that women have been playing cricket and raf will tell you more um, far longer than they have boxed or wrestled or lifted weights or played field hockey table tennis badminton football or even cycled at an olympic games and but in our country this is where we see where women's cricket stands Uh, what we see happening in india is a reflection of the sports uh, sort of historical uh, uh, past as a sport that is rooted across empire and subject in some parts cricket has tried to renovate in some parts of the world cricket has tried to renovate itself over the last 25 years or so in keeping with professional sporting practice but the empire and empire never really quite goes away its center merely shifts and at the moment that center is located in indian cricket the governance model that has been made to work across our olympic sport from the gro- global level through to in- indian structures cannot be made to work um, in indian cricket because right here at the very heart of empire we are seeing at work a particularly desi flexing of old fashioned male entitlement let me read out a few quotes to you from uh, the excellent playfield magazine which was created by sports journalists last year to support their uh, uh, to support their call- their industry during the pandemic the quotes are unattributed um, uh, because there appears to be some degree of embarrassment at having your name put to these words but not enough embarrassment to stop you from uttering them so a bcci official is quoted as saying there is no gender discrimination as far as the bcci is concerned but you just can't compare them with men's cricket and speak of the same pay structure then another veteran official uh, kindly offers you this at your workplace you have to earn your salary by contributing to the growth of the product we are all for promoting women's cricket but please look at it pragmatically you can't have a workers union tactic to demand things women's cricket has to earn an entity of its own and take pride in it this is from 2020 and do note the tone workers union tactic to demand things team and earn an entity these words are so far removed from the olympic charter's ideals um encourage and support women at all levels and in all structures and so that is one of the olympic idols that I'm, that doesn't seem to be here anyway and never mind the other one which is implementing the the principle of uh, equality now in a short conversation i had with saurav ganguly a few months ago about women's cricket he said the women have everything and he recited the women's playing calendar all the way to the world cup so what we are hearing here is em- what i call empire speak uh where oh, one second i'm just going down the wrong yeah yeah what we are hearing here is empire speak or if i may take the liberty uh, to among those of you who sometimes dabble in latin to use an indian uh, uh, indianism 
it's a bristling uh, what you call my bap giri that shows up ever so often in our sport uh, raf i'll explain this word to you a little later uh, this is happening at a time when the olympics are pushing for women's sport to at least be globalized in terms of the basic access opportunity um, you know playing playing time maybe the best route at this point is to say by gones and to look ahead um to turn away from the top tier of indian cricket and see what's taking place at the ground level on friday the opening panel discussion at the uh, sports law and policy symposium was called pathways to the women's game which i would request all of you to listen to uh, those of you who haven't to listen to it again uh, and the pathway uh, uh, offered excellent ideas and excellent examples um it had it had srinivas reddy from the andhra cricket association who talked about their district wise talent hunt Uh, they have a residential academy there. Uh, it had Sabah Karim and Professor Ratnakar Shetty talking about the need for state associations to drive district and zonal competitions and outreach programs in tier one and tier two cities. So, and it had Sushma Verma who was asked as a as a cricketer what she would want to do for for, for women's cricket, and her whole talk was about tournaments. It was about contracts, and it was about just a, a, a an under sixteen tournament, a chance to play, fundamentally. So, what will hold all these scattered initiatives around women's cricket together? It what is what appears to be missing at the top at this point, which is leadership. The desire to actually do on the ground through policy and initiative, rather than to merely proffer words that offer a grand echo. To do like the Olympic movement has done, with women's participation and gender balancing, dragging several conservative countries and federations and sports along with them. so it doesn't matter that there are countries at the olympics who disapprove of women's boxing or wrestling but surely those women can run or fence or ride a horse just give them a chance to show the world that they can do it and more will follow just open the damn door over the last 25 years indian cricket has muscle flexed its superiority superiority over other olympic disciplines due to its financial strength and its distance from government funding and those that regulations attached to it. it has held itself up as an example to other indian sport about how to maximize marketability via broadcast rights and how to earn an income in the case of its women's game however it has chosen to act as if this is the 1970s it's operating outside the whole house of homes of one or two people and it has budget constraints the olympic sports it looked down it looked down upon can give uh, indian women's cricket a lesson on to on how to work with uh, a women it's not that the governors of those sports are saints it's that they have, were given no choice despite this modern flat world globalized uh, uh, uh sporting ecosystem being embraced everywhere including at the icc in indian cricket uh, indian cricket is run not with leadership but with imperium let's take the example of the equal hue report itself which was released at the uh, slpc symposium in 2020 now that is something that the bcci itself could have commissioned okay so they didn't commission it maybe they would want to know what is there in it i know that the report reached them and i also know that there has been zero response in a quiet covid year in a fit of peak maybe they could have commissioned their own study of the state of the women's game um now from this conversation i had with uh, the cricketer mansi joshi yesterday mansi told us that she had played handball she was a track athlete who ran sprints and she jumped but cricket had such a hold on her that she never let it go now that is a romantic story but it should actually be the reverse cricket should not let its girls go this is because unlike with the boys the access points and pathways for cricket are not well defined it is far defined in other sports for indian boys and girls who turn to sport as a means of livelihood it is why apart from traditional strongholds which produce athletes you get female hockey players from mizoram and female middle distance runners from gujarat and this is international uh, uh, our international quality hockey players and uh, and uh, runners india's sports structures are not perfect and have huge gaps in tournament opportunities but our women athletes from the hinterland they know where to go there will always be a district school pt teacher who will know where the nearest sai center is for their mo- for their most promising female students that they may run into cricket is everywhere in india in our face on our screens replete with cash but for every woman who plays it or may want to play it outside of the big uh, metros it is a mirage this when women have been under the bcci's banner for the last 15 years which includes a whole generation for the better part of that time the women cricketers were rendered invisible in those 15 years indian women across other sport found their places in the sun olympic medalists world champions world number ones 
Asian champions, Commonwealth champions, shooters, boxers, wrestlers, jumpers, throwers, fencers, gymnasts, sailors, women in badminton, tennis, table tennis, squash, hockey, football, rugby. The doors were thrown open and their numbers grew. The interest for cricket uh, amongst Indian women lies simmering beneath the surface. And in, that, in, in our numbers, that instantly means we are talk talking of thousands of girls. The performance of the Indian women uh, in those two finals over those two-year period has taken the sport to a point where its spreading ecosystem and its growing fan base must leave its governors, IOC or no IOC, with no options, but to keep pace with the best practices in women's sports worldwide. We must keep hammering to them, you, me, every fan, everyone involved, that India's women cricketers will no more be rendered invisible. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation and the talk. Now we're over to Raphael for her presentation. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a real honour. Um, if I sound a little bit croaky, it's because, as previously mentioned, it is quite early in the morning in the UK. Um, it's about uh, just gone 6am. So, um, yeah, <laughs> hopefully I can still speak coherently and, and contribute well to what I hope is going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, I like to start talks like this um, by sharing a little bit of a timeline of, um, of women's cricket history, um, because um, contrary to, uh, to some media coverage, women's cricket didn't start at Lords um, in the 2017 World Cup final. Um, women have been participating in cricket for centuries, um, as early as 1344. Um, the key dates to highlight on this, um, as, as far as are relevant to my talk, are the formation of the first um, governing body of women's cricket in England in 1926, um, the English Women's Cricket Association, or the WCA, um, the first international women's cricket, which took place um, in 1934, um, an England team visited Australia and played in test matches. Um, Women played in the first ever Cricket World Cup in 1973, um, and that was also the year that the Women's Cricket Association of India formed. India then hosted the second World Cup in 1978, and that was the first opportunity for England and India women's teams to meet each other um, in women's international cricket. Um, and in 1986, um, the Indian women's team made their maiden tour of England. Um, I'll just flag up as well that in 1998, um, the Women's Cricket Association handed over the governance of, of women's cricket in England to the England and Wales Cricket Board, who are now responsible for it. Um, and that um, national level merger was reflected in 2005 when the ICC took over the running of the global women's game from um, the the women who had been running it previously, the International Women's Cricket Council. Um, and that's the point that I'll return to a little bit later. But essentially what we're dealing with um, when we're looking at um, English women's cricket, um, which is, I think, the, the kind of task that I've been, I've been given in today's keynote is to try and kind of explain to you the situation that pre that's prevailing in England. And perhaps we can do some useful comparisons um, with the Indian situation in the Q&A. Um, but we, we've kind of had two distinct eras in England. Um, we've had the amateur era, um, which lasted for a long time, um, right up until 2008. And then there's been a gradual transition to professionalism um, since 2008. If we think, um, starting off with um, thinking about the amateur era, um, so by that I mean that all of the players um, in that period, including those who represented England, um, were completely unpaid. Um, they were having to take time off work to compete um, in, um, and, to, and to go to World Cups. In terms of what this meant for what women's cricket in England looked like, um, well, it meant that um, funding cricket tours, international tours was very difficult. Um, so they were entirely um, self-funded by the players um, and they were organised on the basis of players paying their own um, travel costs, their own uniform and all their expenses um, while they were abroad. And obviously also being prepared to sacrifice several months worth of wages. And there's just a couple of quotes on the slide um, reflecting the situation um, in those first two um, England tours to Australia in 1934-1935 and 1948-49 about um, fundraising etc um, and the, the team that went to Australia and New Zealand in 1934-35 was not representative because the women who went um, couldn't be selected on merit it was all it all had to be done on the basis of, of who could afford to travel. 
Um, now, this leaves quite a, a long-standing legacy that's still being felt um, in English women's cricket, I would say, because it has a big impact on who's playing. Um, so um, it's a very white, very middle class sport traditionally um, being played by women who have um, kind of money in their pockets um, and who are able to, um, to fund what is quite an expensive hobby. Um, in, in many cases. Um, and, and that continues um, right up until um, really relatively recently. If you look at um, surveys being done in the 1990s in England, um, so the General Household Survey I've included here, um, a statistic that shows that only 0.1% of, um, of adult women were playing uh, women's cricket regularly. So it was still a very minority sport. Um, and if you look at um, a Sport England survey from 1999, um, this again um, kind of points to, to it being a very white sport. So um, a figure of um, 0% was actually given for participation in women's cricket by all um, ethnic minority groups. I think that was rounded down, um, but it still shows that that we're talking about um, a sport, as I say, that um, is, is um, kind of um, very white um, and, and very middle class. Um, and um, perhaps um, there are kind of some problems there with um, a sort of um, sense of women's cricket as being um, both perceived and in practice quite elitist. Um, in terms of other issues um, faced um, by women in the amateur era, um, well, um, the legal situation um, as far as women's sport goes. Um, so there is um, landmark legislation passed in the UK in the 1970s. Um, the Equal Pay Act in 1970 is supposed to guarantee equal pay for equal work. And the 1975 Sex Discrimination Act um, outlawed discrimination in England on the basis of sex. Um, however, there is a specific exemption for professional sport um, in this um, 1975 Act. Um, so um, therefore it, it, it's it's um, specifically given um, a, um, a an exemption whereby um, it's perfectly legal for sporting organisations to continue um, paying men and women um, very, very disparate sums. Um, access to all cricket pitches um, is controlled by, by men. Um, they, they own um, all of the cricket grounds in England. Um, and a good example of this is the fact that there are no women's matches played at Lords until 1976. Um, despite decades of, of campaigning on behalf of the Women's Cricket Association. And I think that India women don't end up playing at Lords until 2006. Um, so again, that's, that's very recent. Um, and um, again, there are big issues with generally um, with access to kind of high quality coaching and those kind of resources. Um, so Ruth Prido, um, a very important figure in the history of um, English women's cricket. She became England women's first coach in 1988 um, and devoted an awful lot of, um, of time and effort into that role, um, but she was unpaid. Um, so again, it's still a very um, non-professional setup. And these issues all remain important um, by the onset of the 21st century. We do gradually, though, um, move into a more professional era. Um, it's important to emphasise, um, I think, that this was a very gradual transition, though. Um, and I think, as we all know, change is often very slow and incremental um, and doesn't necessarily happen overnight. The key moment um, comes with this merger in 1998 between the WCA um, and um, and the ECB. And this is driven from above um, by the Sports Council, um, now UK Sports, um, who are the kind of UK government organisation um, who are driving funding and policy for women's sport. And their 1993 policy document recommends that where women's and men's sport is run separately, a single governing body should be established. As the second quote on the slide suggests, there are many women within the WCA who are very unhappy with this, um, with this merger. Um, and they feel that they've kind of been forced into it um, by pressure from above. And they're concerned about um, being kind of being disempowered by the merger um, and handing over power to a lot of men who don't really understand women's cricket. Um, but ultimately that is what happens. Again, I'll, I'll return to that point slightly later. 
Um, so what changes um, at this moment of merger? Well, initially, actually, um, very little. Initially, it's probably uh, quite a regressive move, in fact. Um, it takes the ECB 10 years before it begins this process of professionalisation. So a, a change in governance um, kind of brought about by this legal pressure from, from the government um, doesn't necessarily create change or um, a move towards um, gender equity in and of itself. It takes time. So the key steps on the transition are in 2008, the ECB introduced um, chance to shine coaching contracts. Um, they're kind of semi-professional contracts um, that are funded um, in conjunction with the um, um, with the Cricket Foundation charity who kind of initiate this chance to shine scheme, which is about reintroducing cricket into English schools. And there's 10 contracts initially offered and the women who have them get to spend 50% of their time playing cricket and 50% of their time doing coaching. In 2011, um, tour fees and match fees were introduced by the ECB. And then finally, in 2014, um, we do see the introduction of these full professional contracts. Um, and at that point in time, they were the first fully professional contracts for any women's cricket team anywhere in the world. So this was a major step forward, um, quite a kind of revolutionary step. Um, there were initially 18 um, central contracts. I believe there are now 17. Um, and I've included an approximate figure for how much they were worth on the slide, um, between 15,000 and 50,000, because they were done on a, on a tier basis, um, three tiers, and then there's a captain's contract that sits above that. And that's still the way that they're done. Um, just to give a little bit of context, um, the UK average salary in 2014 um, is given on the slide um, and the UK minimum wage is um, in 2014 is also given on the slide. Um, and um, so they're kind of, um, if you're on a bottom tier contract, you're earning slightly above minimum wage. So these contracts are um, definitely a big step forward, but they're not necessarily hugely generous. Um, they have evolved over time. Um, they now run for two years. Initially, they run for one year. So there's a little bit more player security now, which is great. Um, and the pay has increased. However, um, I have also given a sum based on what um, the England men's test players were earning in 2014, um, which was obviously a significant amount more. And that still remains the case. There's still enormous pay disparity between um, England men's and women's players. And one issue really um, that I think we have in England that I don't think that you have in India is that the ECB have never released exact figures about how much the England women's team are paid and how much these contracts are worth. And my feeling is that that um, is perhaps actually deliberate um, in the sense of um, there's an attempt there to um, deflect the criticism that they would otherwise attract um, by uh, you know journalists like myself being able to say exactly what the um, disparity is between the men and the women. Um, so the sums that I've given are approximate. So why does this um, kind of transition to full professionalism and these why are these contracts sort of introduced in 2014? What is it that changes? Um, well, obviously, um, the uh, the transition to being governed by the ECB is quite significant. Um, the ECB are a, a fully com commercial organisation with a huge annual turnover. Um, they just don't compare with um, the days of the WCA, who are reliant on fundraising, um, very much a volunteer body. Um, but as I've said, the ECB take um, 15 years to move towards having these professional contracts. So there are a number of other factors that, that came into play. Um, one of which is the fact um, that the England women's team had enjoyed enormous success in the preceding years. So particularly in 2009, um, they had won both the 50 over and the 20 over World Cups in the space of six months. Um, and it's unfortunate, but it is still the case that a successful women's team is much more likely to win over um, the those kind of in charge of women's sport and then an unsuccessful team because um, it's a sort of PR move then to celebrate the achievements of your women's team. There's also definitely pressure 
put on the ECB from other women's sports. Um, firstly, there's a kind of general um, sort of societal embrace of women's sports in, in England and in the UK after um, we hosted the 2012 London Olympics. Um, so that's definitely a factor. Um, women's sport is becoming um, kind of more highly visible um, and more accepted um, across society. Um, and um, in terms of um, other kind of um, major participation sports in the UK, um, football or soccer um, is, is the big one. Um, and um, in 2011, the Football Association had launched a kind of semi-professional women's super league. Um, so women's football was seen to be becoming much more of a career option. And what the ECB were hoping to do, I think, by introducing their contracts was to attract the best athletes away from women's football into women's cricket. Um, there's more commercial interest um, developing in women's sport back in 2014. Um, so 2014 was also the year um, when the England women's team signed a major standalone sponsorship deal with Kia Motors. Um, so all of the England women's players got these shiny new Kia Sportages. Um, and this was the day when they announced the, um, the deal at Lords and the groundsman um, was uh, got quite upset because somebody decided to drive one onto the outfield at Lords, as you can see here. Um, so uh, that was very significant because it showed that um, women's cricket was a kind of uh, successful brand, if you like. Um, and one of the women um, pictured on the screen here on the right, Claire Connor, um, I think she is significant as well in her own right. Um, so here she is. Um, she has worked for the ECB since 2008, but she was gradually kind of rising up the ranks. She's now um, leading director of women's cricket. Um, I think having a former player, um, because Claire was an England player herself, in a, um, in a powerful position like that was very significant. She was able to make a, a successful case to the rest of the board. Um, and there's a quote from her on the screen about essentially, we're expecting these players to be super women. Um, and that there was a bit of a tipping point going on in terms terms of the expectations that were being put on them um, in terms of their time commitment to the game um, and therefore it was felt to be necessary. Um, but Claire herself, I think, um, was, was um, always kind of pushing for more. Um, so there's a, a sort of convergence of a number of factors that allow this professionalisation to take place and these contracts to be introduced. I think there is one key thing, though, which specifically explains the timing in 2014. Um, and that is well illustrated by the two contrasting images on the slide. If any of you follow um, men's cricket, um, then you may remember that um, in 2013-14, um, the England men um, suffered a very humiliating tour of Australia. Um, they lost the, uh, the Ashes um, Test Series 5-0. Um, and that was um, then contrasted by the England women's team um, who won back to back women's Ashes series at home in 2013 and then in Australia in early 2014. Um, so in order to escape some of the very negative PR that was surrounding the men's Ashes um, kind of drubbing at the hands of Australia. Um, I think that um, the ECB felt, well, let's, let's reward and recognise and put the spotlight on our women's team who have been much more successful there. Um, so it was almost a way of taking some of the, some of the negative PR and turning it into positive PR. Um, what's, what's happening um, with domestic women's cricket in England or what happens and, and has happened and is happening now? Um, well, in the past 18 months, um, we've taken great strides towards the professionalisation of domestic women's cricket in England. Um, traditionally, um, women played county cricket, um, which was very much um, something that was done on an amateur basis, um, organised on kind of shoestring budgets, um, and the ECB have kind of now branded women's county cricket officially as, as recreational. Um, we then moved into having um, the Kia Super League, which ran for four seasons between 2016 and 2019. Um, and this was a semi-professional 2020 competition um, that was an attempt to kind of bridge the gap between county and international women's cricket and develop higher standards for the England team. Um, and it also attracted the world's best players. Um, so several Indian women played in it, Harman Preet Kaur, Smriti Mandana, Dipti Sharma and Jemima Rodriguez um, all enjoyed stints playing in the Kia Super League. 
Um, one of the problems, though, with the KSL was that it was never funded sufficiently to make it professional um, for all players, except for the um, overseas and for the England women. Um, the level of pay was very low. It only ran for one month a year. And for the other 11 months of the year, all of the participants were effectively still amateurs. Now, the Kia Super League was abolished in 2019 as part of the ECB's new, um, new action plan, transforming women's and girls' cricket, um, which was a kind of, or is a, a central cornerstone of their new inspiring generations strategy. Um, the KSL is due to be replaced by the Women's 100. Um, the 100 is taking place for the first time this summer um, in England. Um, it was going to be played last year, but obviously the pandemic put paid to that. Um, and there's been some really exciting kind of discussions around what that means for um, gender equality in cricket. Um, the uh, prize money for that is going to be split equally between the men's and the women's competitions. And again, um, some of the Indian women, um, as well as some of the other the, of the world's best players are going to be coming to play in that, notably Shafali Verma. So that's going to be really exciting to see. Um, and um, one of the other um, central elements of this new ECB strategy um, is a, a £20 million investment um, in women's cricket over two years, That's some of which is going towards creating um, what we saw introduced late last year, um, so eight new regional centres of excellence to which 41 new domestic professional contracts are attached. Um, so we do now have um, a kind of core or um, a, a core group of new domestic professional women's cricketers in England. Um, so where does this impetus um, for the new domestic um, professional contracts come from? Um, well, I think that... oh skipped over this. Um, Claire Connor has said that her aspiration is for a fully professional domestic women's structure by 2024. So that's that seemed to be the next step, um, quite an interesting aspiration, which was actually expressed pre-pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see whether it happens as quickly as that, but at least we know that that's the direction of travel, as it were. So why um, in 2020 um, does the, do these professional contracts get introduced? Um, I think that there's an element of humiliation that comes with England losing the 2019 Women's Ashes series quite badly. Um, coach Mark Robinson um, kind of explicitly stated that he felt that the, um, the poor quality of um, the England women's um, domestic competitions compared with Australia's um, very high quality uh, professional domestic structure um, was one of the key factors in that defeat. Again, I think that the ECB um, are and were under pressure from other women's sports. So, for example, um, in football or, or soccer, um, the Women's Super League turned fully professional in 2018. So if you're trying to attract the best athletes, the best women to stay in cricket, then you've got this competition coming from football or soccer. Um, I think, though, that it, to some extent, um, the, um, the fact that the domestic professionalisation takes so long in coming in, is testament to, in some ways, the, the limited power of Claire Connor. So I talked about the importance of having her on the board, but she's obviously surrounded by many men who don't have the same commitment to women's cricket that she does. Um, and, um, you know, she actually said she was asked in 2019 at the end of the Women's Ashes series, why is it taking so long to get to this point when you're prepared to commit more resources to domestic women's cricket? And she basically said, well, organisations have different priorities at different times. Um, so um, she's obviously not going to come out and say, well, uh, you know, I'm not supported by the other people on the board. But reading between the lines, that's kind of what's going on. Um, just a quick um, summary of kind of the impact of professionalism that we've seen in England. Um, obviously, higher standards um, makes the women's game more exciting to watch, um, means that we get increased media coverage um, and increased crowds as well. So here's a, um, a photo of the, um, the sellout crowds at the uh, World Cup final at Lords in 2017. Very memorable day. Um, 
And um, we're also getting more TV coverage of women's cricket in England. Um, so since 2015, all home England women's matches have been televised. And that includes um, the, the few women's test matches that are played um, are also all being televised for the first time. So that's quite a breakthrough, um, a breakthrough moment as well. Um, a very key factor as well has been the fact that now um, the England women's team um, are professional. Um, they automatically become members of the Professional Cricketers Association, um, so which is effectively our kind of trade union for cricket in this country. And that means that they get the, all of the support that the PCA provides. So, for example, somebody like Sarah Taylor has had well-documented problems with her mental health and the PCA have been able to support her with that. Um, and also with kind of transitions from um, moving from um, cricket into a post cricketing life, they are able to support those transitions. Um, and Heather Knight is now um, a vice chair of the PCA. Heather Knight is the England women's cricket captain. So they are moving towards having more representation for women within the PCA. Um, what remains to be achieved? Um, well, We've made great strides in English women's cricket in recent years, but we're still a long way from genuine parity with the men's game. Um, for me, as a journalist, um, it's still impossible to make a living just writing about women's cricket. Um, so I am obviously also working as an academic. Um, and I think that that is problematic because it means that often um, the best journalists are forced to go off and work in the men's game and they are lost to the women's game. Um, there's a, a still a lack of diversity, I think, in English women's cricket, and that's a hangover from some of the issues that I talked about earlier. Um, so some of the issues um, regarding women's cricket being a middle class sport, I think, have disappeared because it's obviously now possible to make a living out of cricket and to earn money if you're a woman playing cricket, both domestically and um, at international level. But there are still problems with diversity. Um, we're still seeing um, only two black women have ever played for England. Um, so Ebony Rainford Brent, who obviously spoke quite movingly during Black Lives Matter last year about the racism racism that she'd faced um, within the women's cricket system. Um, and uh, we've recently seen Sophia Dunkley very successfully make her debut as well. Um, so I think that there are still um, issues there in terms of a lack of diversity. Um, and again, um, equal pay. Um, so I've included a, um, a bit of a, a pie chart on the slide um, in relation to the 100. Um, obviously, the 100, as I've said, is being touted as this great moment of equality for um, women's cricket, for English women's cricket. Um, and that's partly because of the equal uh, prize funds that are being given to the men's and the women's winners. But if you look at the overall kind of sums allocated to the 100, um, you can see here that most of it is being being swallowed up by that dark blue segment, um, which is the men's salaries. Um, so there's enormous disparities still there. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, professional sport in England is still um, specifically exempted from the legislation dealing with equal pay, which is now the UK Equality Act 2010. Um, so yeah, that's, that's still an issue. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of, uh, I just wanted to make a quick point about governance. Um, there are big differences in the way in which um, women's cricket was governed by the WCA, WCA and the way in which it's currently governed by the ECB. And one of the important ones is who runs the sport. Um, so this is from the first minutes of the WCA, first meeting, 4th of October 1926. Um, and it was agreed very early on in the WCA's formation um, that no man may hold executive office. It was a women's only organisation. It was a women's only space. Um, it was a very important kind of arena of, of feminism, as I've, as I've argued in my work. Um, who runs women's cricket now? Um, well, it tends to be uh, people who look like these men on the screen, uh, white men um, who have had their formative experiences in men's cricket um, and don't necessarily um, have a kind of grounding um, or a knowledge base of the women's game. So here's my... Um, Here's some, here's some stats um, about um, kind of who runs women's cricket now, um, some quite damning stats. Um, so between 1998 and 2010, after um, the ECB took over women's cricket, no women sat 
on the ECB board. Um, and currently, um, there's just one female chief executive in, um, in county cricket in England. Um, and there's some stats about um, a limited number of cricket board members and cricket coaches being female in England. Um, so my radical uh, proposal for the future of women's crickets devolution. I think we should give serious consideration to adopting a model of devolved governance for women's cricket. Um, for example, in England, we could have the ECB remaining in overall control, um, but the women's game could largely be run by a separate women's cricket board granted its own budgetary autonomy with the ability to make decisions independently of those being made in the men's game. And I think if we if we move towards this model, this would once again mean that decisions would be made with women's cricket as the priority by those who kind of have the welfare um, of women's cricket as um, as their priority. So that's that's my vision for the future, I suppose. And I'll and I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raphael. Now we'll be commencing a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Nandan Kamat. Over to you, Nandan. Thank you so much, Yogita. Thank you, Sharda and Raf, for those wonderful keynotes. Uh, clearly, lots to unpack, uh, many locks to be unlocked. So I think those, those key notes are going to be extremely valuable. But uh, I'd like to come back, uh, Sharda, to a point you made about how the Olympic movement, in some sense, has overtaken the cricket movement uh, with respect to certain mandates, certain uh, sort of metrics that have been achieved with women's sport, how much of uh, the state of women's cricket worldwide is can be placed in a colonial context? The reality that it's essentially the, uh, the UK and post-colonial nations that play this sport. Completely. That has been the entire uh, sort of focus of cricket and how its uh, governance has panned out over all this time, whether it was men, whether it was women. One of the, one of the uh, factors that I forgot to mention while I was talking uh, uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, that there was such a reluctance for uh, uh, Indian cricket to be a part of the Olympics, whereas the ICC is pushing for it to kind of get there in 2020 and you get better funding and it's more widespread. So, you, because then those rules will start to apply. You know, you would think that those rules will, will apply. And then there is a certain, uh, uh, I mean, you're now seeing an example of non-colonial countries, particularly in the women's game, uh, taking to 2020 cricket. You know, you have the examples of Thailand and of Brazil, which has given its women contracts before it gave the men, men contracts. Uh, so you've got all, this kind of spread has taken place almost instinctively because of the of the simplicity of the 2020 format and and so on so it's uh, the format has freed the game of these colonial shackles you know and i think it all the, other than say a country like uh, other than australia new zealand england where women's cricket is uh, fairly advanced uh, uh, um, as compared to say india pakistan south asia i mean uh, uh, the indians would take great umbrage at being uh, uh, included in the south asia basket but facts are facts you know so uh, um, other than those countries uh, uh, you you are because then they have become the example. You know that they have become the model by which uh, uh, other other nations need to follow. And uh, uh, Raf's talk was was very uh, insightful with reference to the scale at which uh, you see the difference that is that is there in 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 the English game. And and in our mind, we're just saying, yeah, but it's there. You know, but it's there. But women have chances. Uh, the, the the point about domestic contracts is also an interesting one because that is being discussed again in India. Uh, it's still it's still very much debatable. It's not debatable. I mean, it's it's just become a question of contention. Is when it, when is it going to happen? It's not even there for the men. Never mind the women. You know. So, uh, so the the colonial structures of the game have been uh, dissipated by by 2020 cricket and its involvement. I think in in the Olympic uh, movement uh, will do a greater lot of good for many many uh, countries that may have issues about governance. Uh, with regard to uh, women's women's cricket, particularly women's sport, women's cricket. Thank you, Shada. And Raf, how do you see this as a historian, as a sociologist? Uh, sort of the issues of, about social mobility in general, sort of voting rights, equality. How do those track to the movement in cricket uh, versus other sports and the broader Olympic and sports movement? Um. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think that actually um, in terms of kind of 
um, women's cricket um, and its relationship to um, kind of colonialism. And one of the things that actually, in my mind, holds women's cricket back in its development um, is is the conservatism um, of of some of the women um, who are kind of involved in in administrating it um, for for many decades um, and um, their um, kind of almost attachment um, to some of these um, you know uh, very colonial ideals um, about um, kind of who should be playing and the right way to play um, and um, their conservatism I think um, in a way um, makes them reluctant to embrace. Um, to embrace the feminist movement, um, which is seen as a very radical um, and a kind of very um, left wing, um, sort of more progressive movement. Um, and I think that there's a sense in which um, if um, in, in which actually um, women's sport um, or, or women's cricket doesn't embrace feminism until this kind of moment um, of the London 2012 Olympics, um, in which suddenly it becomes OK if you're a female cricketer or if you're Claire Connor helping to run women's cricket to actually say, um, I'm a feminist and, um, and I kind of support, um, you know, women's equality in all areas of life. But actually for many decades as a historian um, and when I went and did did a lot of oral history interviews with former cricketers. Um, they were um, kind of very reluctant to embrace that feminist label um, and to see their women's cricket as, it, as at all linked with other sectors um, of women's equality, like work um, and, um, and pay and, um, you know, all those kind of other areas of women's rights, which are so important. Um, so I think that the women's sport has been relatively um, kind of recent certainly in the UK to embrace that um, and that has that ha has held it back and I think that Shard is right that a lot of this is um, is a legacy of cricket's ties to um, kind of um, yeah sort of imperial ideas um, about status um, and about hierarchies um, and about kind of not wanting to rock the boat essentially. Yeah, and I think there's... Uh, yes, Shada, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting what uh, Raf is saying because uh, at, at one point, uh, the, a couple of, uh, I think maybe a year, a few months ago, Diana Adelji, who is basically the foremost uh, Indian women's cricketer and she's uh, uh, most visible in, in terms of speaking out openly about issues in cricket, she actually called the BCCI a male chauvinist organization. And those are actual quotes. Like I mean, that, that's what she said. Saying this is what it is, and I don't think I don't think that you know there is again with with, with the women who play cricket there is a, a, a there's a little bit of let's hold back a little bit to what we really feel. But Diana didn't hold back at all at this point, and I, 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 over the course of her career, she at every point she brought out the fact, particularly in these last fifteen years, where uh, the BCCI was in charge of uh, the women's game and paid no attention to it. So in that sense, it became a very sort of forthright feminist kind of a thing to say. But you're not hearing the same things echo uh, amongst the uh, current women's team or even amongst uh, too many other administrators. They just want to sort of keep it a little bit quiet and keep it a little bit, um, you know, let's get our work done as, as, as much as we can and then we'll see. I don't know what uh, you think about that, Nandan, just sort of looking at it neutrally. Yeah, no, I think if you uh, put a broader context and Shada, I think you've also read, for example, Prashant Kidambi's uh, 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 cricket country about the first women's team to come to the UK and you you read a lot about the role of what is today sort of called uh, social distancing in a COVID context but the, the use of cricket to in some sense show yourself as distant from the common person and in many ways to be more British to be more yes. colonial and to be more accepted in some ways and uh, to some extent uh, what Raf talked about feeds into that which is a colonial context where you cricket isn't a sport that rocks the boat. It does, isn't the one that leads these movements. It follows, it moves like a ship, it comes slowly, it will get there, but it's going to take its own time. Uh, is that a, a fair comment, Raf, when you look at post-colonial countries in terms of the role cricket has played, uh, in some sense, the civilizing role that it was meant to play? And is there an afterglow and sort of a in some sense, a legacy left behind with that role cricket played through the 20th century and in some sense still plays? Two very big questions there. Um, in terms of the, in terms of, so I'll take the, the second one first. In terms of the legacy of colonialism, I think um, certainly in, in England, um, 
that is um, one of the reasons why I think that we still have uh, we're still very far from having um, the kind of um, England women's cricket team that reflects the diversity of our population. Um, and it's a kind of intersectional issue, really, um, whereby, um, you know, it's still quite difficult in, in many ways to access to access women's cricket if you're not from a well-off background um, or if you are aren't, aren't white. Um, and um, I do think that a lot of that um, does does come down um, to, as I say, um, cricket. And, and I think women's cricket is in some ways equally as guilty of this as men's cricket of a kind of embrace of these um, existing hierarchies within the empire. Um, so I think that the legacies are there in terms of who's actually participating um, and that that is um, that's very visible um, just by just by looking at the the England women's team. I've forgotten what the first question was. Can you repeat it? Yeah, no, just the notion of social distancing and being sort of adopted in a British way of life. And uh, it's in some sense the civilizing ideal. Do we still see, in some sense, uh, remnants of that behavior in post-colonial countries, which is essentially the cricketing world, right? Yeah, um, and, and I, I suppose you were kind of getting at whether um, cricket is less progressive than other than Or other rather sports. less revolutionary, let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, and I think that's why, in some ways, the moment in 2014 in which the ECB introduced these women's professional contracts is such an interesting one. Um, and why I kind of focused on that particularly in the presentation, because that is a quite a revolutionary moment um, and probably in some ways um, in English cricket cricketing terms men's and women's one of the most revolutionary things that has ever happened um in in um in cricket in this country um because it really was the ecb kind of being leading the way um and we we i think we sometimes forget that um because we look to australia now and we look at what they're doing and they seem so far ahead but actually at that point those were the only professional contracts for a women's cricket team anywhere in the world um, but um, I think, as I said, that um, some of that is about pressure at that point in time from other women's sports. Um, and th I guess that partly relates to a lot of what Sharda was saying about um, there being, um, you know, a sense in which um, actually what would be what would be useful um, is if kind of um, the BCCI did look to the example of what other women's sports are doing um, a bit more. Um, because certainly that was very significant in England, I think, um, in the professionalisation process was actually this pressure from from other sports and um, this idea that um, we needed to catch up. And I think um, there's definitely a kind of discourse in the 1990s in England that um, that cricket is is fallen behind, um, that cricket is becoming kind of out of touch and is being very much overtaken by soccer, by football. Um, and in terms of both women's participation, um, but generally, um, you know, things like the MCC refusing to accept women members and continue voting against that. The media very much represent that as um, a kind of colonial leftover um, and as you know, the MCC being very stuffy um, and that basically if if English cricket doesn't accept kind of modernity um, and um, you know, movements towards um, more kind of accepting more progressive um, kind of elements in society, um, then cricket will just die. Um, and so um, that, that yeah, and I think that that is probably in some ways a kind of accurate representation. Um, but that so that is why that moment in 2014 is so interesting, um, because it is very much the ECB doing something revolutionary that isn't happening anywhere else in the world um, at that at that moment in time. And, and actually, the BCCI is very much, um, I think, in terms of the top eight or, or 10 women's cricket nations, um, India were actually the last to introduce um, professional contracts for the national team. Um, so, yeah, the, the ECB are sort of leading the way there. I don't know if that really answers your yeah, question. No, I think it does. And it sort of segues into the next question for Sharda. Sharda, uh, you know, the big shifts in women's sport, you can actually track them to pretty significant geopolitical movements as well. Uh, American women's sport around the Cold War to try and show that the, uh, the US is much more progressive, uh, much more sort of advanced than, than Russia in some sense. Then you see China and the, the sort of the Olympic Games in China and to prove a point. So bigger geopolitical movements. Now we are trying to bring reform from within, right? Structures, people, processes. 
do we need to in some sense move away from rights based frameworks and earning and des desert to ride on some bigger movement and bigger alignment and if so are the are there ready alignments that women's cricket as a whole can can sort of i, I wouldn't want to use the word ride on the coattails of but align and grow and get what you want uh you would think that those that big movement for indian cricket was uh you know those two perform those not a geopolitical event but a fundamental sporting event that happened one one day you switched on the tv and india indian women's team was in uh, the quarter final or the semi final of the 2017 world cup and uh, so that would be like a, because of the fact that everything in india is too extreme you know a lot or very little uh so right there at the door of the women's game you had a lot you know it suddenly turned up and it's interesting uh, again what you're saying about geopolitical movements is if you're trying to track how uh, india has done sports wise you know not uh, keep cricket to one side across olympic sport post liberalization uh, and the uh, advent of about say the start of the 21st century is when you see uh, the growth of non profits you see our athletes traveling out and being professionals everywhere else in the world playing professionally golf folk uh, uh, polo a squash whatever it is you know so that is the big event that has taken place that pushed our sports that way cricket was running on its own engine of broadcast rights and revenue and popularity that spun off and then spun again um in uh, uh, 2007 with the uh, with the world cup so uh, i think that there were two points like how for example um, i'm wondering whether you can correct i don't think cricket you can connect to a larger geopolitical event in that sense as much as you can all of the sports with reference to the commonwealth games in 2010 you know as to what happened with that whether you saw with because you had to produce these athletes you had to get to those medals so you had wrestlers and uh, gymnasts and so on um, in cricket you had these two tipping points that came out by pure accident because cricket was fu functioned in a bubble of its own one was the 2007 world cup and one was the indian women's uh, uh, performances over the last two years that you had the 2007 world cup sort of fitted in beautifully with the other substructure that existed in indian cricket that was there that kept growing the two, the women's performance because um, because there was not that that substructure didn't exist so it's like just up floating about in the air you know so i don't think the women's game the women's game could be made to ride on the coattails i think it will have to be rights based because you're getting nothing there's no uh, uh, players association the only sport in india that has a players association of any merit is is football you know there is no players association i think of any uh, perhaps golf which i don't know about uh, in cricket there is none uh, the players association that is there is paid for by the bcci looked after by the bcci is kept silent by the bcci you know so there are all these other uh, uh, sort of factors uh, that are there and uh, you would you would want the market to also play its own part um, because 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 the political entanglements in cricket and in sport are are, are in, in cricket particularly are so complex so you don't know which way uh, it's going to go and an old sort of old fashioned response to to women's sport can very easily be lapsed into uh, for the sake of you know like you uh, from the sports side and out from playfield magazine that uh, to uh, not not so embarrassing that you you won't want to say it but too embarrassing to put your name on it kind of so you can very easily lapse into that kind of uh, almost regressive Uh, mindset and another point is that uh, unlike unlike english cricket for example traditional english cricket indian cricket had redefined itself by being a sport of the street you know it came from the street it was lived on the street it belonged to the street but then when you uh, as you grew you had to fall into this little the, 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 its own empire its separate empire its own hierarchies that's what you had you sort of automatically fit it into and which is where the women are sort of uh, left out of that of that uh, space i don't know whether I'm, saying anything that sort of fits in with with what we are looking in terms of the geopolitical argument in that sense yeah i, I guess i was talking about also there's also beti pada movement is about uh, giving sort of young girls their space can the other uh, one yeah used in some sense yeah. for india's awakening and india making a point on the world stage and not just our, our olympic athletes but also our women cricketers okay going for what i remember the discussion that was there yesterday in this first session that we had they talked about pushing cricket in schools now uh, when you uh, 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 how do you push cricket in school there is this thing called the sarva shiksha abhiyan which all through when i was doing stories about uh, football in the northeast that's what you heard about all the time 
seeing that the start of Shiksha Abhiyan said, you have to have so much time set for play, you have to have this, and it will spread everywhere. So you can try this Beti Bacha, Beti Padao, but how many players are you going to coach and train and keep ready if you are not going to give them games to play? You know, so you have to have a widespread, uh, like, for example, with Olympic sports, you've got Asian games, Commonwealth games, you've got target ga- things that you have to match. In cricket, you can sit without doing anything if, you, if you're really not interested in, in, in pushing or uh, uh, embracing uh, 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 your women's cricket across the country, not just in these little, little pockets, because your numbers will be decent, you'll manage. You know, so uh, you can put a plan in place, but without the BCCI driving it, and without being driven from the top saying this has to be done. We have to have this many people that are there. That are, you know, there are 38 associations. And yesterday the count was about seven or eight are genuinely interested and genuinely involved in doing things for women's cricket. There's another graph, you would be absolutely fan- fascinated to hear this, that there is almost like a shadow women's cricket association of India uh, tournaments. And during COVID, they were trying to run these little programs, you know, just to make sure that the women's cricketers had something to do, to play, to train, whatever. I found it fascinating. I don't know all the details about it, but, you know, for it to be widespread, like the game itself is widespread, is uh, uh, you will need to have uh, 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 direction come from the fact, because the BCCI functions by itself, independently of, of, say, the government order or structure, even though it is now pretty much the government itself, but but you do have that. It it has to come with a, because the institution is not very strong, the individuals that are there have to push much more than they, they do at this point. And take, to take that forward, Sharda, to stay with you, uh, sort of the Supreme Court looked at this and very clearly classified uh, the BCCI as having a public function. Now, uh, it, it doesn't mean that you can sit and do nothing. What do you think the public function of the BCCI is beyond running the Indian men's cricket team? And can the notion of a public function mean that there's actually active responsibility and a duty of care? And uh, is, that, is that a line of legal logic that needs to be taken forward for this movement to, to gain its feet? I, I think uh, it's a very, uh, a, a very sound and a reasonable thing that you're saying, that the primary function of the BCCI is not, to ma- is, is not to make money from cricket. It is to use the money that they make in cricket for cricket. You know, and we are finding that it's the reverse that is happening there. So the, the whole the, the whole sense of public function doesn't exist. You are you're hearing definitions about people talking about, oh, you are working in a company, you have to be able to uh, uh, produce some product or whatever nonsense that quote was. Uh, so uh, uh, the fact that you are there in service of the sport is not present. I don't think it's present in any sports organization uh, beyond, say, a few people and so on. Uh, the the Supreme Court recommendations that had one state, one team kind of a thing, the, it was met with such a backlash that, oh, we have to play cricket in Nagaland. Oh, we have to play cricket in Mizora. It's your sport. If you're not going to make it bigger, who is? You know, and and uh, um, uh, there has to be a response. And, and now, for example, in women's cricket, it's like you're starting on a clean slate. So you've got a chance to do more. And like Raf was saying that you're trying to get the best athletes from uh, from your country to play your sport, you don't know in cricket if you're going to get the best athletes from the country because it's easier for women uh, athletes that are there, girls who want to play sport, to go into so many other things. Not team sports because team sports are seen as messy, so you become runners, you become badminton players, you become whatever else. Whatever the other complications that they, that they may be. And uh, so... We don't even know because there is no auditing that's done even of male sport and the male cricket, never mind female cricket, of how many girls have dropped out of cricket because of uh, COVID. You know, you don't even know that number. And uh, uh, so, I mean, we could go on about the importance of there having to be a public function in it, but it's almost like it will only be driven not by self-motivation, but by some case being put or something happening or something pushing it. You know, that it will come from that kind of thing. And we've seen what happens uh, post the Luda recommendations is blocked. You know, they've said you have to have a woman in the panel, so you'll put some token woman over. You know, that kind of that kind of response, it's a very medieval and it's it, it's quite frightening uh, uh, if you're looking at if you're looking at how uh, at, at how at how um, restrictive almost uh, uh, the the desire is to hold on to this big pot this big pot of gold on Mr. Sitting and not use it, you know, not use it for anything constructive. In a post-COVID world, let's say. 
Rafael, what is your experience with legally mandated change? Uh, you look at the sort of uh, anti-discrimination statutes, equal pay statutes. You have the Title IX in the US, which talks about use of federal funds without discrimination. What is the experience of sports governors in response to forced change? Are they sort of more open? And is that the only thing that's going to get them? Or does it have to come from within in some sense? Um, yeah, it's a really it's a really great question. Um, so in the UK, um, about five years ago, um, UK Sport and, um, and Sport England introduced um, something called the Code for Sports Governance, um, which essentially because um, sports um, are most of the, the main sports are in receipt of money from the government. And the idea was to provide accountability about that. Um, so there were um, quotas introduced, for example, um, and uh, one of them was that um, each of these boards had to have 30% um, gender diversity. So for cricket, for example, the ECB have had to introduce more women on their board to get up to having at least 30% women on the board. Um, and there are various other um, targets like that that they've had to um, that they've had to work to. Um, and um, kind of principles of, of accountable governance so about kind of publishing how much various people in your organisation earn and things like that. Um, and that has been um, that has been enforced, although um, there were kind of questions initially about the extent to which um, penalties were being imposed on organisations because the governance code was um, there was a little bit of nervousness about actually forcing it versus working with organisations. But it has generally been pretty effective. And what we're now seeing is that many more sporting organisations do have um, more like 40 percent of women on their boards now, um, which obviously isn't perfect because ideally you you want 50%, um, but things are things are moving in the right direction. But what I would say is that I think that um, we are now at a point where actually um, you have to move beyond that um, and do the next step, which is much harder, um, because as, as Sharda kind of says, introducing token women on the board doesn't necessarily do anything to change um, the kind of culture mm. of your organisation. Um, so and, and, and legal legal change can only really go so far. You have to have cultural change to match it. Um, and it, it's, it's quite difficult to do a cultural audit of an organisation. Um, and so I, I think that um, that, you know, we're on the on the verge of um, introducing a new um, code of sports governance. It's going to be very interesting to see um, whether there's any attempt to try and measure that the kind of culture of organisations. Um, but yeah, so it's. So in answer to your question, I think that these kind of legal um, aspects of change um, being imposed from above are very important. Um, but if they're not matched by um, kind of a genuine commitment to equality um, within those working in the organisation, then that's quite difficult. And, re and really, that's what takes me um, to my conclusion about uh, about um, devolution um, is that actually what we previously had um, within women's cricket was um, it was being run by people um, who who played the sport, who'd grown up in the sport, who understood the differences between women's and men's cricket because they're not the same. They haven't developed in the same way um, and um, who kind of um, certainly within the English context, really cared about the welfare of the players um, and, and, and cared about growing the game. And that was their priority to a kind of situation where now, um, you know, the men's game has a kind of normative priority. Um, and um, even if you introduce women on the board, if they don't have a background in women's cricket, then there's, you know, there's a kind of problematic aspect with that. Um, so actually, wouldn't it be great if we could revert to a situation where women's cricket was being run by the people who had its best interests at heart rather than having to juggle it with um, an already full agenda um, that's kind of led by led by men's cricket really um, so yeah that's 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 where I'm coming from with that vision I suppose yeah I'd, I'd like uh, Sharda to comment on that uh, but also another sort of related aspect so one is devolution can this work in an Indian context but the second is competition are we better off in sort of US mode let uh, the private sector in let the private sector lead, uh, bring in leagues and just sort of stand back and allow that product to be developed. Because your problem is that there isn't a finished product. You're not willing to invest in product development. So should we in some sense, like I think we had a cricketer yesterday talk about people like other people's bats more than their own bats. Um, just like they like, I think their neighbors' uh, wives better for some reason. Uh, should, should we let this become someone else's bat 
for it to be coveted in the places where change can also occur is there a notion of competition so two two bits your comments on devolution your comments on a parallel system building this product to a point where the bcci or any other body is happy enough with that finished product and it's ready to take it out to the world the idea of devolution is 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 a great one for the simple reason that there is goodwill and there is sort of an interest that is there amongst women uh, uh, that play cricket that are part of cricket uh, to to sort of see the sport flourish uh, I, another uh, so I, I i mean i i think in, in an indian context there is no way bcci would part with even one rupee if they had no control uh, over it you know 50 paisa so uh, but it it's a great idea even the point of uh, what you hear in conversations about women cricket oh they fight with each other they hate each other you know it's all this old sort of uh, 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 stuff that you heard uh, about women for about everything all the way in true history basically so you'll hear uh, it's not as if there is no fighting or hating each other in, in male organizations also the big gap i think that the gap in the bcci's uh, uh, role towards women's cricket is because they have taken away uh decision making and uh, from a, a professional bunch of people that are paid salaries to do a job you know so there are not those people don't uh, they've taken away the power of decision making uh, uh they have uh, reduced the power or they have reduced they've diluted the power of their professional office the ceo the cfo the manager all, all the other sort of little structures that are there it had just begun fledgling and then they sort of uh, uh, took it they've taken it down um so uh, that is also a factor uh your uh, idea about uh, handing it over to to the competition is a great one because everybody knows that the IPL franchises are itching to be able to do something with women's cricket they want to have a women's team and they would run it much better uh, than the bc of even if it's just for a restricted two months of a year or you can have three months of a year of a, of their league competition you know they'll be able to do a much better job because they actually have skin in the game in a, in a, in a genuine way um but again they would not be allowed to do it because it is again a question of territorial ownership of this uh, of this thing and they would want to, uh, the bcci would want control over it they would want a profitability uh, a margin from it so uh, it, it's a great it's an absolutely great idea that okay let let the private uh, enterprises come and, and, and handle this start with the eight franchises that you have and then let's go to the others people say that two more want to turn up and um you know we don't know where it can uh, in in cricket for particular i mean the, the franchise example has worked best for cricket uh, when compared to any other sport in, in in the country it has revolutionized the entire game across the world it may still do so if you get uh, uh, women involved in it so it's it's a radical idea it's it's a great idea then you see okay what happens to the 50 over version and what happens to the longer version but maybe those are issues uh, that you can deal with at at another stage the stage after this after this perhaps Raf, your comments. Does women's cricket need its Packer moment or its ICL moment, Indian Cricket League? Um, well, we they tried a few years ago. Uh, there was a proposal that Lisa Slaker was involved in for a a, a women's independent cricket league, um, uh, but the 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 ICC stomped on the idea pretty quickly. Um, and um and then cricket australia decided to run uh, to decide to organize the women's big bash league um which was basically a response to this idea of a of a breakaway women's cricket league um so i think uh i think shard is right it's all about power and control isn't it um and it's quite interesting what we see in england um which is that um the it's the ecb that um is still despite the fact that i suppose you could argue that to some to 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 um to some extent um the eight new regions that we've got here which the domestic professional contracts are attached to are kind of independent organizations but they are very much being funded centrally by the ecb um and yes they have their own budgets and they have staff um but um you know the ecb is kind of still retaining overall control so it's a very different model to the one that is obviously operating in india whereby um the ipl franchises are totally separate commercial organizations and there are some interesting power dynamics at play there in terms of um well, i mean what we saw in the kia super league was um there was a tension between the teams wanting to win the competition and the england coach saying well hang on a minute i want my players to you know why are you opening with susie bates 
when you could be opening with, um, you know, Danny Wyatt or whoever, uh, who's actually going to be opening for England. Um, and that's what the competition's all about. It's, it should be, uh, from, you know, from the England coach's perspective, it's about developing the, um, the England team and future England players. Whereas from the region's perspective, um, it's about kind of, um, they want to win the competition. Um, so there is definitely a tension there. And I think we're going to see that playing out over the next few years as, as these regions embed. Um, so, I'd, yeah, I think that, as I say, I think Shard is right that it comes down to who has the who kind of has the power and the control. And in, in England, the ECB have been quite reluctant to to cede any of that, I think. Yeah, and I think that just that alignment, uh, Sharda, what do you think about the women, our marquee women players being given the NOCs to play in the 100 and the Women's Big Bash League, while the men are, all, uh, any current player is actually barred from playing any of the other leagues? What is that a sign of? with respect to Indian uh, sort of administration's future outlook for women cricketers? Is it a sort of a release valve, go and play, you can make your money elsewhere and no responsibility on us to build this? Or is it some sort of a broader uh, thing that we need to read into in terms of, is this a first step towards some building something here? We want more, more cricketers before we, we start private leagues. Uh, it's quite interesting that this has happened. It's almost like a way of, uh, 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 go out of us, you know, step away from us, go and do what you want to do. It's fine. Uh, and uh, the way I'm looking at this is that they're saying that the women players, why are the men players not allowed to go and play in all these other countries? I mean, we have example of seven, if now must be more, maybe 17, who knows, are not getting NOCs to play elsewhere. People are retiring quicker uh, because they see them as valuable commodities that they don't want to share with other leagues you know they don't want to share that valuable commodities with other leagues they want to keep the value of the indian premier league at its absolute peak to say our best players are going to play here and you know and the value of the women's game is then seen as it's fine you can go and play elsewhere so you know it's that it's that it's that ghar ki muli dal barabar kind of a thing to say for the women it's like it's it's fine it's fine it's no big deal go play uh, how it will change within the women players themselves you don't know how it will work um, the way I see it, the moment they start to uh, gain separate identities as freelance players is when they will be tried to be reeled back in. Because again, uh, it, it's not that they want uh, uh, sort of women wandering off in this rogue manner, being successful and 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 uh, becoming stars in, in in other parts of the world and and not adding to their uh, not giving being of financial benefit or profit or, or value to them. That's the way that I see it. I mean, I, I think there would women who would love to play in a, in a women's IPL. And I think they still could. This, this thing of saying that we don't know if they are players, yeah, but you're not having enough tournaments or you're not having camps or you're not having outreach programs to see that where the women's players are. Um, you know, so so that's the way I, I, I look at it. I don't think it's an experiment. I think it's just taking the women a little too lightly and saying that it's fine, you can go and play. If it was, if it was a, a chance to want to sort of uh, show generosity and 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 general benevolence. You would let the men go as well. Raf, you you were nodding there. Anything to add on that? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. Um, in terms of as, as a as a female cricketer, can you kind of go off and be freelance? Um, because obviously one of the things that holds. Um, you know, people like uh, Harman Preetkaur back from saying what she really feels about what's going on with Indian women's cricket and and what she really feels about the role of the BCCI is the fact that she's that you know that they're her employer. Um, so actually, the power dynamics would ma would massively change um, were she to actually detach herself from the BCCI and say, no, I'm just going to go off and I'm going to play in the Women's Big Bash League. I'm going to play in the hundred. I'm just going to do these various different things independently. Um, you know, whether that's even economically feasible um, I think that um, the women who have tried it um, so for example Rachel Priest from New Zealand actually found that quite a difficult lifestyle to, to maintain um, financially but it's possible that in the next few years that could actually become a more realistic prospect and then I think that the power dynamic does change um, and and to us in the UK it really does feel that players like Harman Pri are um, are big superstars in, in their own right um, in a way that our England women cricketers 
um, you know, just just aren't because there isn't the same level of interest in cricket in England as there is in India. Um, so, so to me, it feels um, quite interesting to hear Sharda say that she doesn't think that any of the players are, um, or that the BCCI doesn't perceive any of the players as big enough stars yet. Um, I, I think that's that's quite interesting because from our from our perspective, they do feel like they are big big stars already. Yeah, and I think we have just a few minutes left. Uh, just in closing comments to each of you, what is what does an equal hue mean to each of you? And what are three or four things that the that sort of the Indian environment, the broader ecosystem can start doing to move towards that equal hue? Maybe first, Sharda, what is an equal hue to you and how do we get there? Uh, I think uh, everything in our sport uh, is, is, is short and inadequate and this is across all sport about opportunity uh, about access and opportunity is just uh, to a degree that that's a scale so an equal hue is uh, at starts with the very basic principle of access to sport and opportunity to be able at the highest level uh, have i frozen nandan by any chance just a little bit uh, but okay. i think we, we got your audio you can repeat that yeah, I said so. An equal hue is just uh, an equal chance at the absolutely at the starting point of your game. That is access, uh, uh, the 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 freedom to play what you want, uh, the freedom to access the sport you want, and the uh, for women particularly, and 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 the freedom to have opportunities to get better at it, or even just treat it like a a game of leisure, which is available at various to in various degrees to the men. Um, across across uh, uh, and the other question was about uh, how can you do this yeah, uh, how, the just three or four things that any of us not just the uh, people in administration what can we start doing to work towards that idea i think uh, listening to what is being said by uh, uh, female athletes about uh, our cricketers particularly about what they need from their sport or uh, uh, just being able to uh, broaden our minds uh, with reference to what you can offer uh, as sporting careers and alternatives for uh, young girls coming into which which you would uh, in the UK for example I think it's it's much more uh, freely available it's it, it's not seen as a as a, as an odd thing to want to do um, and moving away from the metros I think is also a, a very important part of of, of sort of getting uh, increasing the numbers that are there that's one. And for all sport, it's just having enough playing time at whatever level that you can. It doesn't. You don't have to be multi-billionaire sport in every way. You can be a small sport or a small organization in a small neighborhood. But just being able to give people, uh, give girls a chance to uh, uh, to play, uh, pretty much the year round if they can. I mean that that that's exactly. I mean you start there and, and everything else will I think get healthier as as uh, you go along. Right. Um, yeah, I'd echo what, what Sharda says. Um, I think for me, um, the thing about unequal hue and equality is it's not going to be achieved quickly and it's not going to be um, a uh, something that we can do overnight. Um, it's a gradual process. So it's partly about the goals that you set yourself. Um, and, you know, so, for example, you could suggest, well, women cricketers should be paid the same as men. Um, you know, you might say, well, we're not going to achieve that tomorrow. But if that's your goal that you've got in mind and everything that you do is working towards that, then that's, you know, I think that's good enough. Um, so, yeah, for me, um, kind of an equal hue is about goals. Um, in terms of how we get there, um, well, obviously, my big point is about devolution. Um, but I think that the broader kind of philosophical principle underlying that is about treating the women's game as um, not the same as the men's game um, and understanding that it needs to be handled um almost kind of independently or at least mm. differently and understanding what the different challenges are. Um, it, in terms of what people can do to kind of help achieve that, I think um, partly it's about educating yourself. So by attending events like this, um, if you haven't, then obviously do read the Equal Key Report because it's such an excellent document and it really does lay out the challenges and the opportunities very clearly. Um, I think it was great 
to see during the recent Bristol test that there was so much engagement of Indian cricket fans with the cricket. It really felt like that was a bit of a breakthrough moment, actually. Um, so, you know, if you anyone anyone can do that, anyone can, um, you know, be be using hashtags and be you know going on social media and having these conversations during women's matches. And I think that that shows organisations like the BCCI yeah, that fans care. Um, and that will speak to them in a way that perhaps other things won't, because they will understand that that's what there's a, but you know that ultimately there's a commercial element to that, isn't there? If people care about the women's game, then hopefully um, that will convince the BCCI yeah. to um, to continue investing in it um, and to grow their investment. Um, and I think that volunteers are really crucial in sport, certainly in England. Um, a lot of the grassroots stuff that we see, um, you know, grassroots women's and girls club cricket um, that leads to um, kind of more women accessing the game is, is very much about people just on their own or a group of people starting a club or starting a girl section at a club um, and, and working with that um, and you know, giving up a few hours a week to do that. Um, so if you are in a position to be able to do that and to be able to kind of help um, women and girls kind of starting on their journey on their cricketing journey then I think that that's something that that most people um, can can kind of get involved in on a day-to-day basis as well. Fantastic and just last comment let's say we had the same chat 10 years from now what we, we will all have something to complain about or something to say sort of point fingers at what would show that we have moved to a better place when, what are the sorts of things we should be complaining about 10 years from now? I mean, something we've not talked about a lot is kind of media coverage, I suppose. Um, I think that really um, there's, uh, if, if in 10 years time, we're not in a, in a situation where, um, you know, all women's international and domestic matches are being televised, are accessible um, for people um, to watch, um, then that would be something very much to complain about. Um, and if we're not in a situation where I guess that the women's game is attracting kind of similar column inches to the men's game, that would be something I would very much question. Um, obviously, I've got a little bit of a personal interest in that because I'm hoping that um, I can kind of keep um, keep making a little bit of money and, and maybe, um, you know, that, that, uh, that women's cricket will increasingly be seen as something that newspaper editors want to invest more money in. Um, but I think that that's that's so important in terms of visibility. So if we don't if we don't have that in 10 years, you're, you're welcome to get me back and I'll, I'll, I'll happily complain about it. Fantastic. Shada, last yeah, time. My, mine is. Uh, I hope in 10 years we are complaining about the fact that the difference between the men's and the women's earnings is something like 15% and we're getting really annoyed about it. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, that was a really wonderful conversation. I learned a lot from it. Uh, back to Yogita. Thanks, Nandan. Thank you, Sharda. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, Nandan, for sharing your thoughts and insights. The session's indeed been very informative. Thank you to the Bangalore International Center as well for hosting this in collaboration with the symposium.